Hello! Welcome to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Oh. Nice to see you all. Oh my god, there are pl- placards over there. Anyway, I'm glad to be back. Um, I was out of town last month. Um, so, welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB, which has been going for many years, as you all know. And anyway, this time, um, before I welcome our first reader, I'd like to say, um, tell you who some of the future readers are going to be. <clears throat> July 20th, we have Daniel Brom and Gregory Frost. August 17th, you can clap if you like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, August 17th, Veronica Shanos and Richard Butner. Yeah. September 21st, Nicholas Kaufman, who's yeah. here. <laughs> and a new writer named, <coughs> named Nassim Jamnia. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced. Um, and then in the future, we have, <coughs> I'm not, I can't remember the exact dates, Clay McCloud Chapman and Meg Ellison. Yeah. Wow. So that's what we've got coming up. Now, both readers have what have. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I have, <clears throat> he just smashed that into my face for people who are listening but not watching. Um, I forget what I was going to say. Both readers. Both, both readers, readers brought sell. books to sell, and both readers have book birthdays. Yesterday, I think, was Karen Hewler's book birthday, and today is Sam Miller's book birthday. No, yesterday was mine too. All right, so they share a book birthday. And they have books to sell. So I just want to let you know, I have gotten a bunch of my own books that came out recently, and I have way too many of them in my apartment. So I brought a couple, and the first one of each, how do I put this? The first person who buys a a book from Karen, first person who buys a book from Sam, each will get a copy of Screams from the Dark, if you want it. I mean, some people don't want monster anthologies. Uh, so I brought two, and what? What can I say? You know, it's always a use for it. Oh, yeah. So anyway, and one has a cover a little torn. I noticed. <clears throat> anyway, let me, and they will be selling books in between when we take a break and after the readings. So, Karen Euler's stories have appeared in over 120 literary and speculative magazines and anthologies, from conjunctions to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction to weird tales as well as a number of best of the year anthologies and in one of mine anthologies, <clears throat> When Things Get Dark. Um, her latest novel, The Splendid City, has just <laughs> been published <laughs> <laughs> by Angry Robot Dick. It's a tale about stolen water, an exiled witch, and her gun-wielding cat, and a city run by a self-declared president, who we have pictures of, <laughs> who loves parades. <laughs> Uh, sound familiar? <clears throat> anyway, she has a literary short story collection about dementia coming out in August, and Fairwood Books will publish a Slice of the Dark, an SF slash F mix this coming November. Please welcome Karen Mueller. bits and pieces from The Splendid City, and I'll start at page one, so you will be as ignorant as the ordinary reader and learn as we go. Chapter one, Liberty. Betsy Bundaroo 
was used to seeing cats, but not ones who walked upright or spoke. She was standing at the bus stop reading the notice that said the bus had been canceled permanently. Why, she wondered, why don't they say? But these were the times, indefinite suspensions, removals, reversals, etc. Things suddenly were, and that then just as suddenly were not. The structure is breaking down, she thought, and no surprise there. She felt a sort of grim satisfaction in it. So much had already changed since the election. Why not this too? Why should anything work when none of it made sense? The president did not want buses to run anywhere near the palace. And that was necessary, she supposed. She understood. But the larger problem was that the world was going crazy. No one could tolerate anyone who didn't agree with them. It's true, the big black cat said, nodding wisely. Ah, she had been muttering again, a bad habit that was growing on her. The cat was wearing a bow tie and a fanny pack. I'm finding it very hard to have a reasonable conversation these days. Everyone shouts sound bites and no one shouts facts. I wonder if there are any facts left, she said with a sigh. I mean, everything is endlessly manipulated. If she'd had time, she would have wondered why she was having a conversation with a cat, but right then and there she felt it was best to be polite because he was such a very large cat. <laughs> and he sounded irritated. Things would be so much better if there were no internet, the cat said moodily, because it spreads everything too fast. People see crap, believe it, and act on it before there's a chance to respond. And there's never just one response, it branches out. Have you heard about those mushrooms whose underground roots spread out for miles in all directions? That's the internet for you. But mushrooms are, mushroom roots aren't right or wrong, she said, frowning. I don't think you've got quite the right kind of analogy there. <laughs> Really? He asked with a nasty, hissing kind of snarl, pulling off his fanny pack and rummaging through it quickly to pull out a gun. <laughs> really? He asked again and shot her. <laughs> she clutched her upper arm. Blood ran through her clothes. The cat put the gun back in his pack and ran off. Eleanor was going to be mad. A happy growl rose in his throat. How was your day? Eleanor asked the cat when he walked in the door. She could see that he was miffed. He was always miffed. I shot someone again, he said, sighing. <laughs> he had to agree it was becoming a nasty habit. I do regret it. You always regret it. It was very hard not pointing out the cat's failures. She tried to make sure her face was neutral. It wasn't easy. She had pale skin, medium length brown hair, hazel eyes, and a face that gave everything away. Well, that just tells you about my character. I'm not r actually the kind of person who goes around shooting people. And yet you do, she said. <laughs> Let's consider the circumstances. No doubt they said something to annoy you. What was it? He frowned and shrugged his shoulders. She contradicted my theory about the internet being like that huge mushroom root. Stan, Eleanor said firmly, it's a bad analogy. <laughs> Now do you want to shoot me? Stan scowled. I do. <laughs> of course he wanted to shoot her. Shooting people made him feel better for a while. And it was certainly true that she could benefit from being put in her place every so often. She was bossy, opinionated. He was the way he was because of her. Why not talk it out instead? You have the power of speech, so why not talk about these things instead? Gloria will blame me if you continue to go around shooting people. I never kill them, you know, he said, his hairs rising. Try to be the kind of cat who never shoots them in the first place, she said. You're just drawing attention to yourself. The cat shrugged. Who'll believe a cat shooting a woman anyway? They're a nation of believers here, she said in disgust. Read a newspaper once in a while. Of course, his hands twitched at that, but he only allowed himself one shot a day. <laughs> They were walking down the street when a bell rang out, a familiar sound in the city, though it roved from district to district around the palace. People stopped and turned, waiting to see the messenger approach. The message could be good or bad. Once a van had stopped a woman and then gave her the car that pulled up behind her. Then there was the time when a bunch of men got out of the van and grabbed a, ma a young man, a Latino, I'm sorry, a Latino by the looks of him, and pulled him inside. 
An older man ran towards the van, but he was too late. They were gone. The messengers were often on the news and were the most popular part of it after the reported disasters in the rest of the country and any attempts to overthrow the republic. Then the weather, updates about the president's latest triumph, and finally on to the messengers. People loved the giveaways and ignored the disappearances, which were generally explained as reunions. <laughs> they were also fond of the whipped cream pies that hit people identified as tourists from the north. <laughs> They'd better not hit me, Stan muttered. I've got a gun. Eleanor snorted. Everyone here has a gun. <laughs> My gun is better, he said with satisfaction. Eleanor could see no point in challenging that. Besides, she often carried a can of whipped cream with her in case anyone threw a pie. She might not be able to prevent it, but she was all for revenge. Finally, Stan said, there have been fewer messengers this week. That's a relief. Maybe. I was hoping they'd stop for me and give me a car. You can't drive a car. Why not? She scowled. You're a cat. There were times when she thought that he just couldn't see himself as he was, but really, when had he ever? Which could change at any point, you know. All I have to do is hang in, and all you have to do is learn to be nice. He circled around himself in agitation for a moment. But that's the flaw in my plan, he growled. We're here because you were a jerk, Eleanor snapped. He always did it. He always had to bring things up and bring things up. And yet you're here too, he purred. What could she say? He was right. They were each other's punishment. She couldn't get rid of him until she redeemed herself with Gloria. She hated to admit it, but she was shackled to the cat. I'm here to find out what happened to Daria, she said. Gloria hadn't given him a mission, and she liked to point that out. You know that's not completely true, he said smoothly. Gloria wanted to get rid of you before she heard about Daria. You went too far. You always go too far. She didn't dignify that with an answer. She knew perfectly well that she and the cat were bound together until Gloria decided they'd learned their lessons. Luckily, she was also there to help find a missing witch, <clears throat> and that at least made it seem like Gloria respected her. I make the decisions, she said finally. You're in charge of nothing. The cat dropped to the floor in an elegant way and circled around her, pumping his tail up. But to continue, he said, I can say with all modesty that I do deserve a car, a convertible, deep blue, I think. <laughs> I suspect the van would decide to take you away instead, she scoffed. And since, since no one cares what happens to the disappeared, I wouldn't care either. It wasn't a good look, she thought, saying things like that. But the cat was so annoying. <laughs> I bet it's some kind of parking problem, the cat said philosophically. Like getting towed. They don't tow people, they tow the cars. In other places, yes, but this makes more sense. He got a little jaunty, swaggering and swishing his tail. He was like that, completely indifferent to what happened to others. The bell was getting closer. She was determined to see what it was this time, to see up close. She and the cat had been in the city for three years now, adjusting and observing. Three weeks, sorry. Everyone had explanations for everything, but she wasn't quite going to fall for it. She would keep her New York City smarts for as long as she could. There could hardly be a good explanation for people being taken away. A large tan van with side and rear doors rounded the corner. There was a cheerful logo on the body, a smiling chicken with a frying pan. How typical, she thought, pretending animals were delighted to be killed and cooked. <laughs> the van began to slow down and some people stood still watching, their heads swiveling as their anticipation built. Others, mostly Latino, took corners, vanished into stores or upstairs, and still the van moved along, ringing its merry bell. In another era, it might be a siren, Eleanor thought, but it didn't matter. It was never ignored. Everyone had their eyes on it. <laughs> and then they could all see where it was heading. A young man turning to stand and face it down, his legs spread out firm against the ground, his arms crossed, his head high, his eyes relentlessly watching it approach him, closer and closer. How fierce he was. She could feel the tension rising in the air. Everyone contributed to it as if they were a master beating heart. The van's door opened, two arms reached out, grabbed him, and he was gone. Ooh, that was good, Stan said. <laughs> Neat and clean. Uh, a little bit later, Stan gets sent to pay the water bill. The water is cut off constantly. You have to pay by the hour. 
and uh, Eleanor gives him a $20 bill. So Stan clutched the $20 bill in his paw for a block, then tucked it into the pocket of his bow tie, which Eleanor had made specially for him to shut up his constant complaints. He strolled down the street, listening idly to the shouts not too far away in the distance. He liked to think of himself as an observer of the human condition, having recently been human himself. Having experienced life as both cat and man, he felt he had a unique width of perspective. Why go to work when mice were so abundant? Why wear ugly clothes when sleek black fur was so superior? He took the long way around to the water office, thereby encountering the outskirts of the Tuesday parade. He saw signs that said, support our coal workers and others that said solar power isn't power. He could see some signs with business logos as well. Not merely the ever-present chicken with a frying pan, but also water is beautiful signs, which had the virtue of not meaning much at all. The energy signs were propaganda. He was superior enough in his understanding of the world to know that. This week's march was therefore about energy, which made everyone feel good since it was a warm, pleasant day. He turned a corner and ran into a line of people forming the end of the parade, or the side of the parade. He hurried up to join them, picking up a discarded sign that read, you don't need progress when you've got good solutions. <laughs> what do you think of this sign, Stan asked a marcher once he, si once he had sidled into the middle of the crowd. It was moving slowly, and protesters waved to each other in delight. His fellow marcher looked at it briefly and then shrugged. A lot of words to carry. I prefer small signs. He waved his, which said merely, we're right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this covers just about everything, and it's easy to make. I've always felt very right as well, Stan said companionably. The marcher frowned at him and moved away, and Stan quickly wandered back to the edge of the cheering crowd and sauntered off heading for the water store. There was a grumpy old man leaning over the counter as Stan entered the store. No cats, he said without rancor. Stan looked behind him, surprised. Cats? I don't see any cats. You're a cat. My dear sir, I have a rare skin condition that makes me look like a cat. I am used to constant humiliation, to whispers and stares and the odd, odd can of flung tuna, but I am not a cat. The waterman stared at him for a lengthy piece of time. Okay, he said, as long as you're about to pay me for a water transaction. Otherwise, get lost. You see right through me. I do indeed want to pay for today's water. He handed over a piece of paper with an account number and an address. We appear to have neglected to pay for today, though I believe you'll see the rest of the week is paid up. The guy looked rapidly at his monitor, clicked a few keys, and said that will be $100 for one day. Reinstatement fee, update fee, penalty for lapse, plus he has $40 per day charge. That's ridiculous. It's always been $20 a day. Stan was about to say more, but the fierce look on the guy's face stopped him. The rates went up. You want it or not? I only have 20. That was all Eleanor had given him. He was not about to touch his own money. Tell you what. And then the old man suddenly got conspiratorial. You give me 20, I'll give you what, say, five hours of water? He glanced at the screen again. And five hours tomorrow? But from then on, it's unfortunately double and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I have not marked this very well at all. I'm constantly wondering where I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> Eleanor tried... No. Page 39. Eleanor wasn't feeling generous about the cat. In truth, she was never feeling generous about the cat. So her eyes narrowed and her mouth frowned when he walked through the door after midnight, smelling a beer and humming in the language of cats, the bastard. <laughs> he stopped at her glare. What? He asked. Didn't you have a good day? I did not. He shrugged. I had a wonderful day. I saw a man being taken by the messengers, but he gave me an interesting note before he was gone, <laughs> and I passed a parade consisting entirely of suspended umbrellas, which was interesting because you had to figure out how they did it. I figured it out very quickly, of course. <laughs> there was a man on a tricycle with clear plastic bars like a cage all around him, and the umbrellas were meant to all the bars. He was followed by an elephant with a big sign for Upton Umbrellas and holding an umbrella in its trunk. It was an advertising parade. 
It was very well done. He was talking a little too much, very obviously throwing in a diversion. She would know it was a diversion, but she wouldn't know what from, so he still <laughs> held the upper hand. Eleanor opened the pantry door, bent down, and picked up a cardboard box. Stan groaned. Not the box. Not right now. But she ignored him, took a step into the next room, and put the box down. He had no choice. Try as he would to ignore it, it kept calling to him. Would he fit exactly? Would the fat around his middle spill over the sides? Would he tuck his feet in so neatly that he looked like a loaf still in its pan? Sitting in boxes was so comforting and life-affirming that he had to promise himself he would only sit in it for a moment and then go about his business finding the treasure. He stepped in and sat. There was no longer any reason to move anywhere else. <laughs> Eleanor looked at him with contempt. For all his superior air, she still couldn't resist a box. How must that feel? Being unable to resist, lured by one's own nature, abandoning reason, she was sure it felt like any other impulse, obsession, or quite frankly, knee-jerk reaction. She knew a lot about those. She was often trapped by a reaction, just as a cat was trapped by a box. Presumably, it was just in their nature. I'm going to quickly skip ahead. Eleanor had quickly gotten used to seeing the president's animatronic heads in various places all over the city. <laughs> they were out in the open in the parks and plazas, and she came upon them near churches, stores, ATMs. She had asked a perfect stranger what they were for and been given an odd, appraising look and a quick, new in town? Yes, this is our president. I understand, but why heads? Why so many? He loves us and he's everywhere for us. He's always available when we need him. It's a great comfort and solace. I don't know if he'll listen to you, though, as an outsider, I mean. The stranger started to walk off and then turned. I hope not, he said. He's ours. <laughs> she saw people walk up to the heads, huddle close, and whisper. Like a confessional, she thought. She saw a woman step back from a head halfway down the block, and felt a tug of curiosity. Was there a man behind the machine? Was it a recording? How did it work? She approached it and stood, waiting. What do you want, the head said amiably. Is there anything you would change? The head sat on a platter, ruffled with green silk. The face was an idealized version of the president's face. Smoother, friendlier. <laughs> of course, the president always seemed to be friendly. His eyes blinked and changed focus and followed her she moved. It was uncanny. She looked at the head skeptically, trying to analyze why it had such a bland expression, yet provoked such an annoying reaction. It blinked its eyes, and its gaze followed her as she circled it. All right, she said finally, hello. It nodded. How are you? Fine, thanks. She rolled her eyes at herself. Really, should she thank a computer or a recording or whatever this was? Are you better than you were? The question unexpectedly stunned her. Was she better? She was not at peace with herself, certainly, but she was going forward. She had done something she shouldn't have done, even if it was to a person who deserved it. That was confusing. Was she saying that the action was itself justified, but she was not justified in doing it? That kept spinning out in different directions because looked at objectively, if the action was right, then the actor was right in doing it. Wasn't that so? <laughs> How could the action be right and the actor be wrong? Still, she admitted, logically or not, that she shouldn't have done it. Would she do it again if pushed that far? She hoped that she had improved, gotten better, had more control over her temper, her responses, her instinct. Her instinct sometimes lashed out, and it was confusing that Dolores had said that this impulsiveness, wrongness, was something she hoped to use in, uh, in order to find the missing witch. So, in that case, a wrong action would lead to a right end. And she wasn't like that all the time, anyway. She had made one mistake, one huge mistake. It was also true that she had always avoided people because they annoyed her. They were not, not like she was, and they had always noticed she was not like they were. Was she any better now? The head was patient. The head allowed her to think. She was looking for the missing witch. She was living with the cat and hadn't killed him or thrown him across the room. In fact, they went their separate ways and had made a kind of accommodation with each other. That was something. She recognized that what she had done to the cat was wrong. She should have done something that didn't jeopardize the witches. She straightened up her head. Yes, I'm better. Not perfect, but better. She felt relieved that she could say it. 
I knew it, the head said. I've done all I could to improve the life of the people I serve, and I'm gratified to know that I have helped you in whatever way I could. You didn't help me, she snapped. I helped myself. We all work together under my administration to improve the people's lives, working together to get rid of greed and hypocrisy. And hypocrisy. Greed is your ruin. Give to my campaign as a token of your dedication to the abolition of greed. Will you give a small donation now to spearhead our campaign for a greater liberty? The head grinned and waited for her answer. A small shelf came out with a touch screen for a credit card. After two minutes of silence, it discreetly withdrew. <laughs> the head made no mention of it, but instead continued, our greatness relies on our ability to move forward in humility and loyalty. Of course, not everyone is loyal, and that's a danger to our democracy. Maybe you know people who are struggling with this, and you would like to do something to help them move forward with you and with us. A moment's pause. The, be the best thing you can do is to help them the best thing you can do to help them is to tell us who they are. We'll reach out to them. We'll send specialists to help them love our great democracy. <laughs> Sometimes people just need a little kindness to discover how great we can be together. They're probably unhappy too. Don't they seem unfulfilled? Tell us. Tell us and we'll help them. She stepped back. She was horrified. A little bit of light lit up the head's left eye. Was it a flash or was it a reflection? She looked around. It was a bright day, there were cars and birds and anything could have made a shadow or a reflection. But she felt uneasy, terribly uneasy. She stepped back and then stepped away. Remember, we love you, the head called out. Thank you. about a five ten minute break or so have a drink pay your bartender and give her tips and um, we'll be back soon and buy some books buy books and you'll get a free book just wait for the music here thank you welcome 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 back this is fantastic fiction at KGB welcome we've been doing this in person again for I don't know how many months uh, we were uh, we were uh, virtual for about 18 months during the pandemic. It was it was good actually. We had we had, we had people from all over the world. We had people from uh, Barbados, South Africa, Pakistan, Australia, England, Canada. You know, almost everywhere. Um, not everywhere, but a lot of places. And it was uh, it was it was great because like not everyone can come to New York, obviously. So um, it didn't completely suck. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB is a monthly reading series held on the third, third Wednesday of every month. It's hosted by myself, Matthew Kressel, and Ellen Datlow. So, we thank you so much. We're hosted here at the KGB Bar. By the way, can we keep that door open? Because we want people to come in and out. Like, like let's, let's open it up. Like, welcome everyone in. Like, you know, like it's Passover. Like, like come on. Anyone who wants to come in and drink, please. Um, Yes, uh, so we only ask, it's, it's always free, there's no cover charge, we only ask, please, buy a drink hard or soft, support the bar, support your bartender. Mary, she's working hard to keep everyone here hydrated, thank you Mary, please, just do that, you, you support the bar, you support the series, keep everything going, thank you. Um, so, I, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Sam J. Miller. Um, Sam and I uh, share a writer's group. Sam has uh, been in that group for how long? Altered Fluid is the name of the group, by the way. Nine years. Nine years. Has it been that long? Jeez. Um, and uh, he just continually impresses me with the, um, the stuff that he, he writes. It's just uh, beautiful, heartbreaking, uh, lovely, just, and then, um, Every time I think that oh he can't top that he he does, uh, so I'm just I'm just really proud that I, I get to introduce my my friend and and partner in 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 this writing world this adventure, 
Uh, Sam J. Miller's books have been called Must Reads and Best of the Year by USA Today, Entertainment Weekly, NPR, and O, the Oprah Magazine, among others. He is the Nebula Award-winning author of Blackfish City, which has been translated into six languages and won the John W. Campbell Memorial Award. Sam's short stories have been nominated for the World Fantasy, Theodore Sturgeon, and Locus Awards, and reprinted in dozens of anthologies. He's also the last in a long line of butchers. He lives in New York City and at samjmiller.com. You're sick. Hi, friends. Um, my story doesn't have a talking cat with a gun in it, so it's not going to be as much fun. It's going to be a bit of a downer. Um, so I'm reading tonight from my short story collection, Boys, Beasts, and Men, which just came out yesterday. Um, I, have, I have copies to sell, and everyone who purchases one will get a, also get a free copy of my last novel, The Blade Between, while supplies last, courtesy of we have too many in the house, and they take up too much space. <laughs> My husband will greatly appreciate everyone you take off our hands. I'm going to read a story from the collection. Um, this story is called Things with Beards. Um, it was a Nebula nominee in 2015. Um, it's kind of like a super gay fanfic of John Carpenter's 1982 movie, The Thing. So it's a little, it's a little controversial. I have, to, I have some controversial opinions about The Thing. Um, like that... You know what, I'll, you'll figure it out in the story. <laughs> but like when you t say on the internet that you think so-and-so was a thing, a lot of people get really upset. They get more upset that you say they think you think they were a thing than if you say they were actually gay. Um, but whatever, it's all, it's all good. Um, I'm gonna read this story that I've cut a few, I've cut one big plot line from so that I can read this and not bore you all to tears. So just assume that it's way better in the book because <laughs> it has an extra plot line that, I, that you're not gonna hear tonight. McCready has made it back to McDonald's. He holds his coffee with both hands, breathing in the heat of it, still not 100% sure he isn't actually asleep and dreaming in the snow-drifted rubble of an Antarctic research station. The summer of 1983 is a mild one, but to McCready it feels tropical, with 125th Street a bright, beautiful, sunlit oasis. He loosens the cord that ties his cowboy hat to his head. Here he has no need of a disguise. People press past the glass, a surging crowd going into and out of the subway, rushing to catch the bus, doing deals, making out, cursing each other, and the suspicion he might be dreaming gets deeper. Spend enough time in the ice hell of Antarctica and your body starts to believe that frigid lifelessness is the true natural state of the universe, which, when you think of the cold vastness of space, is probably correct. Heard you died, man, comes a sweet, rough voice, and McCready stands up to submit to the fierce hug that never fails to make him almost cry from how safe it makes him feel. But when he steps back to look Hugh in the eye, something is different. Something has changed. While he was away, Hugh became someone else. You don't look so hot yourself, he says, and they sit, and Hugh takes the coffee that has been waiting for him. Past few weeks I haven't felt well, Hugh says, which seems an understatement. Even after McCready's many months in Antarctica, how could so many lines have sprung up in his friend's black skin? When had his hair and beard become so heavily peppered with salt? It's nothing. It's going around. Their hands clasp under the table. You're still fine as hell, McCready whispers. You stop, Hugh says. I know you had a piece down there. McCready remembers Childs, the mechanic's strong hands still greasy from the ski dozer, leaving prints on his back and hips, his teeth on the back of McCready's neck. Of course I did, McCready says, but that's over now. You're still wearing that damn fool cowboy hat, Hugh says, scoldingly. Had those stupid centerfolds hung up all over your room, I bet. McCready releases his hands. So, we all pretend to be what we need to be. Not true. Not everybody has the luxury of passing. They sip coffee. McDonald's coffee is not good, but it is real. Honest. Childs and him, him and Childs, he remembers almost nothing about the final days in Antarctica. He remembers taking the helicopter up with a storm coming, something about a dog, and then nothing. Waking up on board a U.S. supply and survey ship, staring at two baffled crewmen. Shud shredded clothing all around them. A metal desk bent almost in half and pushed halfway across the room. Broken glass and burned paper, and none of them had even the faintest idea of what had just happened. 
Later, reviewing case files, he learned how the supply run that came in springtime found the whole camp burned down, mostly everyone dead and blown to bizarre bits, except for two handsome corpses frozen untouched at the edge of the camp. How the corpses were brought back, identified, the condolence letters sent home, the bodies, probably by accident, thawed, but that couldn't be real. That frozen corpse couldn't have been him. When MacReady is not MacReady, or when MacReady is simply not, he never remembers it after. The gaps in his memory are not mistakes, not accidents. The thing that wears his clothes, his body, his cowboy hat, it doesn't want him to know it is there. So the moment when the supply ship crewman walked in and found formerly frozen MacReady sitting up and watched MacReady's face split down the middle, saw a writhing nest of spaghetti tentacles explode in his direction, screamed as they enveloped him and swiftly started digesting, all of that is gone from MacReady's mind. But when it is being MacReady, it is MacReady, every opinion and memory and passion intact. The fuck just happened, Hugh asks, holding up a shredded sheet. The sex was that good, I guess, MacReady says, laughing, naked. I honestly have no memory of us tearing the place up like that. Me either. There is no blood, no tissue of any kind. Not MacReady sucks all that up, absorbs it, transforms it, as it transformed the meat that used to be Hugh as soon as they were alone in his room and it perceived no threat, knew it was safe to come out. The struggle was short. In 19 minutes, the transformation was complete and MacReady and Hugh were themselves again, as far as they knew, and they fell into each other's arms, into the ravaged bed, out of their clothes. What's that, MacReady says, two worried fingers tracing down Hugh's side. Purple blotches mar his lovely torso. Comes with this weird new pneumonia thing that's going around, he says. This year's junkie flu. But you're not a junkie. Well, I've fucked a couple lately. MacReady laughs. You have a thing for lost causes. The cause I'm fighting for isn't lost, Hugh says, frowning. Of course I'd not. I didn't mean that. But Hugh has gone silent, vanishing into the ancient Tron uh, MacReady has always known was there and tried to ignore ever since Hugh took him under his wing at the age of 19. So many of the men down there wore beards. Winter, he thought at first, for keeping our faces warm in Antarctica's forever winter. But warmth at the station was rarely an issue. Their warren of rectangular huts was kept at a balmy 78 degrees. Massive stockpiles of gasoline specifically for that purpose. A fright, aside from the occasional trip outside for research, and MacReady never had more than a hazy understanding of what exactly those scientists were sciencing down there, but they seemed to do precious little of it. The men of his station stayed the hell inside, so not warmth. Beards were camouflage, a costume. Only Blair and Gary lacked one, both being too old to appear as anything other than what they were, and childs who never wanted to. He shivered, remembering the tough guy act, the cowboy he became in uncertain situations, same way in juvie, in lockup, same way in Vietnam. Hard, mean, masculine, hard drinking, woman-hating, queer, psh. He hit so many things, buried them deep, because if men knew what he really was, he'd be in danger. When they learned he wasn't one of them, they would want to destroy him. They all had their reasons for choosing Antarctica, for choosing a life where there were no women. Supper time, MacReady would look from face to bearded face and wonder how many were like him under the all-man exterior they projected, but too afraid like him to let their true self show. Not MacReady has an exceptional knack for assessing external threats. It stays hidden when MacReady is alone and when he's in a crowd, and even when he is alone but still potentially vulnerable. Once, past four in the morning, when a drunken MacReady had the 145th Street bus all to himself, alone with the small woman behind the wheel, not MacReady could easily have emerged claimed her, but it knew somehow, gauging who knew what quirk of pheromones or optic nerve signals, the risk of exposure, the chance someone might see through the tinted windows, or the driver's foot in the spasms of dying, slammed out hard in the brake and bring the bus crashing into something. If confronted, if threatened, it might, might risk emerging, but no one is there to confront it. No one suspects it is there. Not even MacReady, who has nothing but the barest, most irrational anxieties. Protean fragments, nightmare glitch glimpses and snatches of horrific sound, feedback, bleed through from the thing that hides inside him. MacReady knows that something is wrong. He keeps seeing it out of the corner of his mind's eye, hearing its echoes in the distance, lost time, random wreckage, 
McCready suspects he is criminally, monstrously insane, that during his blackouts he carries out horrific crimes and then hides all the evidence. This would explain what went down into Antarctica. In a terrifying way, the explanation is appealing. He could deal with knowing that he murdered all his friends and then blew up the building. It would frighten him less than the yawning gulf of empty time, the barely remembered slither and scuttle of something unhuman, the flashes of blood and screaming that leak into his daylight hours now. McCready rents a cabin, upstate, uninsulated and inexpensive, 10 miles from the nearest neighbor. The hard-faced old woman who he rents from picks him up at the train station. Her truck is full of grocery bags, all the things he requested. No car out here, she says, driving through town, not even a bicycle. No phone either. You get yourself into trouble and there'll be no way of getting out of here in a hurry. Let me out up here, he says when they approach the edge of town. You crazy? It'd take you two hours to walk the rest of the way. Maybe more. I said pull over, he says, hardening his voice, because if she goes much further, out of sight of prying protective eyes, around the next bend maybe, or even before that, the thing inside him may emerge. It knows these things somehow. Have fun carrying those two bags of groceries all that way, he, she says when he gets out, asshole. Meet me here in a week, he says, same time. The first two days pass in a pleasant enough blur. He reads books, engages in desultory masturbation to cheaply printed paperbacks of gay erotic stories Hugh had lent him. Only one symptom, hunger, low and rumbling and not sated no matter how much he eats. And then, lost time. He comes to on his knees in the cool midnight dirt behind a bar. Thanks, man, says the sturdy bearded trucker type standing over him, pulling back on a shirt puzzled by how it suddenly sports a spray of holes, each fringed with what looks like chemical burns. I needed that. He strides off. McCready settles back into a squat, leans against the building. What did I do to him? He seems unharmed, but I've done something, something terrible. He wonders how he got into town, walked, hitchhiked, and how the hell he'll get back. The phone rings his first night back. He'd been sitting on his fire escape, looking down at the city, debating jumping, though not particularly seriously. Hugh's words echoing in his head, help us or don't. He's still not sure which one he'll choose. He picks up the phone. Mac, says the voice, rich and deep and unmistakable. I won't even try to do a Keith David. Uh, <laughs> Childs, been trying to call you. Cars honk through the wire. Childs is from Detroit, he dimly remembers, or maybe Minneapolis. I was away, had to get out of town, clear my head. You too, huh? McCready lets out his breath once he realizes he's been holding it. You? Yup. What the hell, man? What the fuck is going on? Childs chuckles. Was hoping you'd have all the answers. Don't know why. I already knew what a dumbass you are. A lump of longing forms in McCready's throat, but his body fits him wrong suddenly. Whatever crazy mental illness he was imagining he had, Childs sharing it was inconceivable. Something else is wrong. Something his body, his mind rejects, but his body already knows. Have you been to a doctor? Tried, Child says. I remember driving halfway there, and the next thing I knew I was home again. A, rise, a siren rises, then slowly fades in Detroit or Minneapolis. McCready inspects his own reflection in the window, where the lights of his bedroom bounce against the darkness. What are we, he whispers. Hellbound, child says, but we knew that already. Midnight, and McCready stands at the center of the George Washington Bridge. The monstrous creature groans and whines with the wind, with the heavy traffic that never stops. New York City's most popular suicide spot. He can't remember where he heard that, but he's grateful that he did. Astride the safety railing, looking down at deep black water, he stops to breathe. Once, McCready was angry. He is not angry anymore. This disturbs him. The things that angered him are still true, are still out there, in most cases even worse. His mother's hands at the end of a 14-hour laundry shift, Hugh and Childs and every man he's loved and the burning glorious joy he had to smother and hide and keep secret. He presses against these memories, traces along his torso where they've marked him, much like the cutaneous lesions along Hugh's sides, and yet like those purple blotches, they cause no pain. Not anymore. A train whistle blows far beneath him. Wind stings his eyes when he tries to look. He can see the warm, dim lights of the passenger cars, imagine the seats where late-night travelers doze or read or stare up in awe at the lights of the bridge, at him. Something is missing inside of McCready. He can't figure out what. He wonders when it started. Antarctica? Maybe, but probably not. Something drew him to Antarctica, after all. The money, but not just the money. He wanted to flee from the human world. He was tired of fighting it and wanted to take himself out. Whatever was in him, changing already, Antarctica had fed it. 
He is a monster. He knows this now. So is Childs. So are countless others. People like Hugh, who he did something terrible to, however, however unintentionally it was. He doesn't know the details, what he is or how it works or why, but he knows it. Blair built a spaceship. The image comes back to him, complete with the smell of burning petrol. Something in, he saw in real life, or a photo he was shown from the wreckage. A cavern dug into the snow and ice under the Antarctic station. Scavenged pieces of the helicopter and the snowmobiles and the ski dozer assembled into a spaceship. How did he know that's what it was? Because it was round, yes, and nothing any human knew how to make. But there's information here, something he's missing, something he knew once but doesn't know now. But where did it come from, this memory? Panic. Being threatened, trapped, having no way out. It triggers something inside of him, like it did in Blair, which is how an assistant biologist could assemble a spacefaring vessel. Suddenly, MacReady can tap into so much more. He sees things, stars streaking past him somehow, shapes he can take, things he can be, repulsive, fascinating, beings without immune systems to attack, creatures whose core body temperatures are so low any virus or invading organism would die. A cuttlefish contains so many colors even when it isn't wearing them. His hands and neck feel tight, like they're trying to break free from the rest of him. Had someone been able to see under his clothes just then, they'd have seen mouths opening and closing all up and down his torso. Maybe he'd have been strong enough before. Maybe that other MacReady would have been brave enough to jump. But that MacReady had no reason to. This MacReady climbs back to the safe side of the guardrail and follows the George Washington Bridge back to solid ground. And that night, he stands on the subway platform, drunk, exhilarated, frightened. A train pulls in. He stands too close to the door, steps forward as it swings open, walks right into a woman getting off. Her eyes go wide and she makes a terrified sound. Sorry, he mumbles, cupping his beard and feeling bad for looking like the kind of man who frightens women, but she is already sprinting away. He frowns and then sits and then smiles. A smile of shame at frightening someone, but also of something else of a hard-earned, impossible-to-communicate knowledge. MacReady knows in that moment that maturity means making peace with how we are monsters. Thank you. That was really great. So, now, buy these books. <laughs> buy the books so they don't have to take them home. Karen's books, she has some here. Sam has a bunch of books and he will give some away for free. Please help these poor people get rid of their books. <laughs> and I Karen, accept cash and Venmo. <laughs> okay, I think Karen just accepts cash and maybe checks. Cash and PayPal. Oh, PayPal, okay. And buy a drink, tip your bartender. Hope to see you next month. Hang out, do whatever you want, but drink. <laughs> and welcome. Thank you. You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.